Happy Thursday, everybody. We are Happy live Thursday. and we're out, we're on time this this week. That's good. We're start we're starting to get good at this, Dan. Kind of watching the clock and it's like I, three, I two, and I know. Yeah, yeah. We're we're synced with time zones and everything. You have your, your Brooklyn shirt on today, Pat. I do. You're, you know, you're um representing. Yeah, I well I guess. Um I haven't worn this in a while. You know, just I saw it in the closet this morning, kind of spring weather. I said, I'm going to put my Brooklyn shirt on. I hadn't thought about the fact that it was going to be doing a webcast, but there it is. Wait, wait a second. You don't wake up on Thursdays <laughs> knowing we're doing this show. I think I, I think like, I think do, your, do your hair and you uh, yeah, that's, you got to think about what you're going to wear. You got to, you know, I, we're going to have to work on this. We need to, we need to talk to costume. This costume is the, but makeup. this is the new normal though, Dan, this is the new, <laughs> This is the world we live in now. It's just, you just got to be ready to be on. Come as you are. In a moment's yeah, notice, yeah. come as you are, yep. Yeah, well, it's easier for me because I have the, the shaved head, but you, know, you still have to comb your hair and stuff. And so you got a little <laughs> more work to do. <laughs> Isn't Didn't everyone want to hear about our grooming habits and what we think about wearing before the show? This is, inquiring uh, minds want to know. Well, welcome everybody. We have... So who do we have on? Heidi, good to good to see you. Hope it's hope things are going well and you're jo- enjoying beautiful weather today in Stillwater. Hopefully you're not in the office. Um, Elsa, welcome again from over the pond. It's good to good to see you. A handful of some new folks. It's good to see everybody. Um, and Allison, thank thank you for opening up. Allison. Allison is one of our mo- a new, incredible, brilliant, radical team members. So we're really happy to have Allison. Um, you'll see her name more and more. So welcome. Um, <laughs> um, so we have a, a fun show today. And, um, yeah, you know, one of the, the core topics, which you probably saw on LinkedIn, is we're going to talk about how do we make meetings suck less? And, you know, there's been a lot of, um, certainly a lot of debate about meetings, right? Who should be invited? How big should they be? How long should they be? Make sure the people who attend um, should be there, have clear objectives. You know, this stuff we, we all know. We don't practice it as much, I think, as we should. But, you know, today we're going to dig a little bit, little bit deeper into, you know, how do we really have um, authentic meetings, meetings where there's, I think, as um, James, Dr. James Kelly, who's going to be our guest today, talks about a a trust highway. And um, he's uh, got some really, a really cool technology and and some great research on on this. So I really can't wait to dive into that uh, today. And, but what I want to, Pat, I thought what we could chat about is is a larger kind of meta concept. Our uh, mission statement, purpose statement at Radical is we inspire change. Right. And it's a lofty and it's a bold statement. When I tell that to people, um, you know, usually the, the, the feedback is that's you have a big job in front of you, right? especially where we are today. So I kind of wanted to break down um, what is change? Right? Um, what should we expect from change? What does it look like? What does it feel like? Um, can we see it? Is there an end? Right. And uh, how do we how do we measure it? So, uh, you know, we all, everybody, I don't really care what business you're in or what you do, we, we use the word very freely. We need to change things. Things need to change. Um, you know, change is important. Change is necessary. And, and, and I actually want to start to break down the word and really get to a little more meaning around what do we mean when we talk about change and especially change, cultural change within organizations. Um, so I think this will be a... a fun kickoff to this and we, we're going to apply this we're talking about changing meetings and changing the way we show up and changing the way we have more effective productive collaborative meetings um so pat i did i did before we started i, I quickly went to webster's i always love to do this and get the definition for change um and and i'll note one fun thing it it started out the first one is uh, to make different and um in some particular, never bothered to change. So, so to just ultimately to make different is is the key, is the key definition. The second definition in Webster's is to make radically different, to transform. 
So I thought that was hmm. um, that was that was interesting. So thanks to Webster's, maybe maybe they just updated it. Um, yeah. So Pat, oh, what are your your thoughts? I mean, yeah, to make radically different is yeah. is not is be the B definition in Webster's. So, um, and I, yeah, I just read that five minutes ago. Um, so, you know, Pat, we were chatting about this be, before, and you you had some interesting. Um, you know, thinking about art and change and just love to get your perspective on, on, on change and how you think about it. Yeah. Well, there's, I mean, uh, it's such a gigantic consideration and you're right, Dan, we, we probably, we have very high expectations, I think of what change means. Um, and it also, there's so many different kind of uh, levels of magnitude when we think about change. Um, you know, there's the personal, like, I want to, ch- I want to, you know, change by getting healthier, you know, and then there's an organization saying we, w- we need to change culture here. You know? And then, then there's society saying, you know, we need to change the way we think about, you know, really complicated things like institutional racism, you know, or things that are just gigantic, complex considerations that we, that we live with. And it's very, and it's very easy to, um, to kind of accept the notion of it you know, kind of maybe even accept the challenge, the idea of it, but then, but right, once we get into it, what, like you said, what, it's almost like you're in a river as you start to sort of be cognizant of the idea of change. And, you know, I think Dan, you and I were chatting about this over the last couple of days, but change is long, it's really along a continuum. And it's easy to say things like, you know, you know what, things never, never really change. Things never really change here. You're not going to change, <laughs> you know, those kinds of things. But is that really true? Um, sometimes, uh, but sometimes change is so subtle and you know, both for the good and the bad, um, that it's this kind of very amorphous, you know, process and business has tried to frame this when it can from, uh, you know, oftentimes from, a you know, kind of a measurement perspective, like, okay, we're going to measure certain things and different concepts here and break it into constructs, understand a baseline, create a target. And then we're going to kind of measure, you know, we're going to measure the change to see if we're moving against target or you know, whatever, whether that's a financial consideration or even something, you know, more um, people specific like employee engagement or uh, performance yeah. or leadership attributes or something like that. But the, the truth of the matter is that it really is complex. And like you said, to, to kind of completely shift frame, um, I was, um, or the frame on this. Yeah, so I was um, meeting with a visual artist last night. So, so my wife and I are actually art collectors and I, I love looking for art and artists who find a way to kind of capture the moment that we're living in. Um, and there's, um, so there's an artist named um, Jonathan Herrera. Um, and we have a couple of his pieces and he's a Latin American um, artist, maybe about, you know, 23, 24 years old, born in the U.S. His parents are undocumented. And he makes this incredible work that captures the complexity of the shift and change that he's going through personally, you know, as someone who is, he's actually never even been to Mexico before where his parents are from. Uh, but he, uh, but his whole family is and a lot of it's still in Mexico. And, um, and his work kind of gets into the complexity of kind of understanding identity, understanding change of what he's going through and his family's going through and then what the larger culture is going through. And he uses a lot of text and a lot of imagery to kind of get at that. And he delivers when his, when his work lands and he's got some incredible work, it just, it creates that space where you can, for a moment, if you're you know, aware of his work and you're looking at it, you're in that space of kind of understanding about the sentimentality of change, um, the, mm-hmm. the um, epicness of it, and also just kind of the simplicity of it all at the same time. And he's, so as an artist, to me, he's, he's getting into that, like we can hold, you know, for me, when I see his work, I like it because I'm able to kind of hold the moment to understand what that, what that looks like. And he's someone who brings a completely different perspective than, you know, to, to another yeah. world that that's different from mine. So, yeah, so that's a completely different frame, but, but it does get at, I think, which is what you're saying, Dan, that pretty complex notion of what kind of what change is and how do we kind of understand it and how do we both appreciate it and how do we both with intention move towards something that can actually shift and change towards ideally a positive outcome. Yeah. Well, I love that analogy and example. Um, because in any given moment, right, we have to sort of um, breathe, breathe in th- that current moment, right? And, and so, and, and art usually, it typically, especially uh, a visual art, represents a snapshot <clears throat> in a long, many times a very long continuum. 
And I think with, with change, sometimes it, it's easier to sort of be in that moment and say, you know, things are, things are not changing. Things haven't changed fast enough. Verse celebrating what has changed. And I think we too often are fueled by being in that place where things haven't been changed enough. And I think we need that outrage and ang anger sometimes, and it's so important for change. But we also have to celebrate how far we've come. And I think you know, art is a great example of that um, because it is taking that snapshot in that moment. And you know, I was using one example, Pat, earlier around uh, you know, a blossoming flower <laughs> or, or so, it, it, you can, you know, over three days, you might, you might, there might be a flower. It's not, it hasn't begun to, to begun to blossom. You walk out three days later, it's completely changed and it's blossomed. If you sat there and stare and actually looked at it for three days straight, you'd probably also, number one, you'd go a little crazy, but, but that's exactly the fact. You'd go a little crazy watching it, trying to watch that change that every, you know, but meanwhile, it actually is changing. But in the moment, like this is this thing's not blossoming. I'm seeing no, nothing happen. But three days later, it has blossomed and has changed. So I think that's an interesting analogy, and, and um, um, you know, and, and that's why I think we have to always take the time to celebrate what has changed and 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 try to honor that and learn from it, um, but continue to fight for the change that that we must see and need to see, um, especially on social social issues. And this needs to be applied within the organization too. So, um, yeah, I love that example of of, of art um, in that point in time, in that snapshot of time. Um, I'm reading James. Yeah, it sounds like yeah, choice versus, versus evolution versus revolution. I, <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna let you. That I, I love that statement. Uh, we might have to just jump right into that when we bring you live. Um, so, you know, let, let's kind of apply this to. To meetings, Pat. You know, you and I have been entrepreneurs, and um, we've made plenty of mistakes, and we've had successes, and we've learned how to bring people together. At least we've done our best to bring people together and inspire them, and and build something. Um, and a lot of that is is leveraging the best of people, um, bringing and having meetings, right, <laughs> and talking about stuff and making decisions. And you know, um, what are some things that that you think? you've personally done well uh, around this and what have you learned over, over the years around just how do we bring people together? How do we make the time we spend together important, relevant, focused, um, and, and, and useful? Yeah. I mean, I remember years ago when we were growing like crazy at modern survey and, you know, we went from a, being a company of five people then to 20 and then to 40 and 50 and then we were acquired by aeon and then we we're you know in this gigantic company and watching the, the scale of of um bringing people together and, and the complexities of it um and uh i certainly became a big fan of very short focused meetings um and i remember getting increasingly better at a few things at least i thought we were getting better at it you know, try to keep meetings inside of 30 minutes as much as possible. You know, I'm, I'm a big fan of like the 25 minute meeting. Um, mm -hmm. Make sure when things kick off, um, you, you always lay out objectives so everyone knows kind of what we're, you know, and when we're done, what do we want to walk away with? So I just love opening up a meeting that way. And the second thing is, and this is, I, I, and I know when we talk to James, he'll talk a lot about this from the leadership perspective. But as a leader, if, you, if it's, you know, you're one of the leaders in the room, it's really not about, it should be about you listening. I mean, for me as a leader, it's like, I really want to listen from everyone in the room, you know, um, and invite conversation and in toward the objectives and use the kind of constraints of time to drive really high quality conversations. You know, if you let things just kind of settle, you know, conversations just tend to kind of meander and there's no edges and boundaries to kind of sharpen up and crisp up the way conversations can happen. So I do think there's, as a leader, get good at being able to kind of, again, use time as an edge, as a boundary, and then um, try and hear from everyone on the team. So there's everyone sort of energetically invested in the process. To me, that's like, that's the ideal to personally for me to move toward, but it's really easy to fall into bad habits, especially if you've been seeing people in a while and you just want to catch up because we're humans, you know, you want to socialize, and you want to connect. Yeah. And so there's another natural part of this, you know, which is, hey, I just want to kind of hang out a little bit, you know, and sometimes there's time for that and sometimes there's not. So yeah. anyway, that's, that's, for me, that's certainly something no, that, I, yeah, that yeah. I've learned to think 
about, or at least how I've learned to kind of think about meetings in a, as a construct yeah. for doing work. You know, you know, Pat, and I wonder if, um, and we'll see what James's thought is on this too. Um, obviously we've really shifted and work has changed. Like, mm. we've, like we've talked about over and over again, everything has changed and meetings have, have gone from in-person to virtual. Have we been more productive? I don't know. <laughs> I, 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 you know, it's, it, is, is it, it are, is there less small talk when it's virtual um, because you lack that, that personal energy and that face to face? Um, but we're all, we were also going through tough times. So I think we found ourselves having more personal conversations and asking more questions about each other, um, you, you know, adverse jumping right into the agenda. So I, he, he, so I, I'd love to get, when well, we get James on in a moment here, just get his, his perspective on that too. And I completely agree. Look, and there's a time and a place um, for meetings I think it's great sometimes when a meeting just goes in a different direction. And, and sometimes I think you kind of need to let that happen too. And that's being very agile with, with, with meetings. We might have an agenda, but we might realize, you know what, this is better, right? Where this is going is actually a more interesting conversation and we can follow back on, follow up with this other stuff later. Um, so I think it's always been, um, uh, you know, really tuned in to the moment right, and tuned in to the purpose of the, the meeting, but also tuned into the energy in the room. And, and if there's a new energy or a different energy, maybe embrace that, take advantage of it. Um, well, so with that, let me just talk a little bit about James and then we're gonna bring him, him live. So um, James is the uh, co-founder and CEO of a company called QChange, speaking of, speaking of change. Um, and um, the purpose of, of Q change, it's very, uh, I mean, uh, like we talked about earlier, making, making meetings suck less, but <laughs> the purpose is helping leaders and teams be better in meetings. It's very focused, um, very genuine, very actionable purpose. And I had an opportunity to meet with James a couple months ago, and it was just a really great conversation and just a, a, a brilliant guy, passionate guy. Um, he, uh, I know he's, published, I believe in 2018, and James can correct me if I'm wrong, um, wrote a, a book, the, the, Crucible's, the Crucible's Gift, Five Lessons from Authentic Leaders that Thrive in Adversity, Providing Unique Perspectives on Leading Team and Driving Change was, um, was a, a book that he wrote. So, um, and a little bit about him, I know here he's, he prides himself on being different and thinking different, and I, you'll find that's absolutely true and you know, committed to having a positive impact on, on people and teams and, and leaders. So I, I'm really excited to bring him on. Um, he's coming to us from Oregon. And without further ado, James, I am gonna send you an invite and we are gonna get you, get you on live with us. So coming your way. You know, as we wait for James to pop on, I do love how the work of his platform and, and, and his, you know, his focused work as well is that kind of a behavior awareness and behavior modification, right? And that's what so much this ends up really kind of distilling down to. Um, so really excited to get into the conversation. Hey guys. How's it James. going, James? Good. I was What's taking up, notes, writing sarcastic comments on the side. It was great. Good. Enjoyed that's the way that. to do it. That's good. <laughs> that is the way to do it. Good, good yeah. to see you. Nice to see you as well. Nice Pat, is it weird that you're seeing a twin without the five o'clock shadow right now? I know. I feel, I'm not sure how it's arranged for you guys, but you're flanking me yeah. on either side. So I feel like, yeah, I'm yes. feeling a little, uh, I don't know. We, we did plan it like, like we something's going like, yeah. on. That's why, that's why I signed on early, Pat, because whoever signs on first yeah. gets, gets the left yeah. spot and I knew you'd be in the middle. So are you, are you very, feeling very inadequate right now? now? You're wishing you I, had I no just, hair? It's just odd. I just yeah, feel it's... odd. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking maybe I, I just go grab a shave for the shaver Pat, and just trim it, it off right now. It might be might be time, man. I think oh, it might yeah. be time. I, I will bring my 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 clipper in tomorrow and just got to go for it. Yeah. All in. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, thanks, guys, for having me. Yeah, yeah, for, so we're, very show. happy to. So tell us a little bit about. I mean, I gave you, I gave a an yeah. intro. Uh, hopefully, I I I, I uh, gave you did a not bastardize summary of, of who who you are. I, uh, <laughs> it's good, but tell us, yeah, what, what you're, uh, you know, what you believe in and kind of a little bit about your history and a little no. bit about key change. Yeah. So thank you again for the opportunity. Um, my background is super random. Um, I don't know if it's as random as some of the stuff you guys have done in the past. Um, and, and, but you know, I, over the last 15 years I've lived on 
in, in four different countries for a significant time. So I've spent four years in Australia getting my PhD in consumer psychology. Uh, I just finished living in just outside Dubai for four years with my family of six wow. and just moved back stateside in the middle of COVID, which is a whole other story. And if you drink, alcohol must be involved um, moving back. And I've spent a time in Japan and obviously in the US, I've lived in about seven cities, all as an adult. Biggest, most recent was Philadelphia before the Middle East. So uh, my back, my background is I'm a PhD in consumer psychology. Uh, as you mentioned, Dan, I wrote a book in 2018. Uh, and the book was premised on an old podcast I had, old, sounds weird, from 2015 to 2018, where I interviewed uh, roughly 150 executives from Fortune 2 companies to entrepreneurs and everything in between. And the whole tagline was, I care about who you are, not what you do, because who you are defines what you do. And so it was really autobiographical about them from childhood to adulthood. And I very rarely asked about their actual work as a leader. I asked more about trials and tribulations and, and um, you know, not to rip off Dak Shepard, but I definitely was armchair couch expert before he was, because I would kind of try to connect the dots of, well, you were abused as a child and you're really controlling as an adult. Do you think there's anything to go with those two? And you know, like, and so for me, it was just a ton of fun and a lot of learning. So the book is based on that um, and kind of what I learned from interviewing all those leaders. And there's excerpts from that in the book and so forth. So um, fast forward to 2018, I launched Q Change in 2019 out of the Middle East. Met my business partner who happens to live in Bend, Oregon, which is where I'm at now. And if you haven't been, please come. It's gorgeous. And um, yeah, Q Change has really been a fun journey. I mean, you guys know how the startup journey goes. So it is trials, tribulations, excitement, anxiety, um, schizophrenia, really it's schizophrenic um, any given moment of the day, depending on what news you get. So we just got off a pitch. I was saying, Dan, we had a pitch right before this. So I'm running out of a pitch into this and uh, it's great. Yeah, it's great. Hopefully that gets you up to speed. Good. How, how did the pitch go? Thumbs up? Feel yeah, good? You never know. Come on. Like, you, yeah, I know. Like, <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Yeah. You know. so sometimes you know, with, with yeah. pitches, it's, you feel like you feel like they're, they're too nice and you're like, oh, you know, it's always the ones where you're like, yeah, we, we didn't do so well that somehow you ended up winning. I, I don't know how that happens. This, this is one of those where I feel like they, they were like, sorry for the hard questions. I'm like, uh, they're not hard there. Like they were pretty easy. So yeah, yeah. I have no idea. I, you know, I'm in, I'm in that phase right well, now, just pitching two to three times a week, you know, um, yeah. again, you guys know how it goes. Well, finger, yeah. and, fingers crossed for you. Yeah. Thank you. Are, are you pitching? Are these sales pitches or are these investor pitches? Investor pitches. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah okay. Sales pitches are a snap. Investor pitches can be brutal. Oh yeah. I know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know it's, it's interesting. Yeah. I don't know if you if, if you've ever get a chance to be on the investor side. It's amazing how your psychology. You learn to be like a jerk really quickly. Yeah. You know, I've, I've sat through as an investor. I've sat through probably you know hundred pitches or whatever, and and you're like, oh man, I can't believe I'm about to do this to this person, but I'm going to ask him the terrible questions that people used to ask me when I was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, it's not bad. I think you know we're part of this ecosystem called the Battery out of the Berkeley, and it's it's an accelerator. Um, and their whole their whole ethos is network of the network. So a lot of the investor advisors are also part of other angel groups. And so we're having to run through pitches in our pitch deck. And, you know, I, I did a pitch last week to someone out of the Midwest. And I'm so used to five minute pitches that I was like, bam, 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 bam. And he's like, whoa, we got plenty of time. Can you just unpack it? Like, sorry. It's like autopilot for me that you have five minutes and that's it. So you know, yeah. anyhow, not, we didn't come on to talk about pitches. So yeah, no, no. <laughs> that, that, that's well. actually a good topic. So, so let's jump in. Um, <laughs> so there's a, there's a stat that we actually found and, and, um, and I'm not exactly sure what, what year it's from. And, and James, you probably know this off the top of your head, but I'll quickly read it. There's, there's 55 um, million meetings a day. And yeah. currently 69% of employees say meetings are unproductive, leading to poor employee experience. Yeah. That's from, so that's um, a pretty significant, Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, that's a pretty, I mean, I, and I would completely agree with that and maybe the numbers changed a little bit, but it's a significant opportunity. Like, like yeah. when we talk about change, like we have an opportunity to be more effective, more productive. 
um, in meetings and give everyone a voice, right? I mean, th this is so important when we think about inclusive environments um, and bringing everyone to the, to the table, all, all are welcome. So let's talk, let's just jump right into, you know, how, how do we make meetings suck less? How do we make them better? And, and, and I guess with that, I'll ask you to, how do we measure a successful meeting? Yeah. Right. So, 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 you know, maybe it's a two prong question, but that's really the premise of, of what, what you do. So we'd just love to get your, mm -hmm. your thoughts on that and your philosophy yeah. around that. So here, here's our philosophy. Um, meetings is, you know, as a leader, you spend over 60% of your day in meetings. And, and for some, as you move up, it's 80, 90% of your day. Um, and what our belief system is that we're all human beings, right? On average, you spend 90,000 hours of your life at work. Think about that. Like you spend more time in an office than you do with your family over the duration of your life. And, you know, one of our core philosophies is let's create authentic connections. Because really an authentic connection is where growth, development, um, appreciation, compassion, empathy really strive from. And without that, work sucks. Like if you're there as a transactional environment, that's why engagement's so bad, right? So, so we think meetings is where humans show up. So our whole core thing is let's create the ecosystem around driving self-awareness so that leaders and teams, and, and when we say teams, that's above a leader, below a leader, it's all around the leader, um, are really driven to be responsive to what that individual needs to work on to be better in a, in a nurturing, compassionate, and really um, purposeful way, if that makes sense. Um, and I know those are a lot of foo-foo words that kind of go, don't necessarily jive in like a big fortune 100 company. But when you start rolling back the literature from HBR to MIT Sloan, uh, it is so overwhelming the amount of work around where, for example, compassion drives revenue, where uh, integrity drives outcomes and lowers turnover. I mean, it, it is so bound with research around this. But yet as organizations, there's like this mental blockage of weakness if you actually embrace those things versus coming from the point of strength of that actually drives excellence, not precludes excellence, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I, I, I love that. And I think you're um, – and I agree some of those words are, are overused, but they've become – I think we really need to – to embrace those those words over the past twelve months more, more than ever, right? <laughs> yeah. I mean, words like compassion, words like empathy, words like humility, um, words like understanding, you know, active listening. I mean, this this is stuff that you have to get it right, um, like you said, because those are the things that ultimately drive, inspire your people, create those that, those authentic relationships and those authentic connections. And if you get that right, and and you have your people culture right. You know, everything else is going to follow. But if you don't get that right, I don't care how yeah. great your product is, how great your idea is. Um, eventually, there's going to be it's going to break down at some point. Yeah. If you don't have that authentic connection, teams that are working together, solving problems every yeah. day. Yeah. You know, and when I and when I think back over, you know, my history too as an entrepreneur and leader, you know, those moments, especially in meetings, when, like you said, there's that shared connection and there's a there's just that moment of it could be, a, you know, a shared empathetic moment, a shared sense of achievement, a shared something where we kind of all feel something at the same time collectively. Um, you know, that's something that really you carry with you and the team carries forward. And, you know, I know when you when you ask people about, you know, where they work, those are the kinds of things that they, they will talk about first. Oh, I love my team, my teammates, or it's just such a great place to work. You know, you know so that's where people tend to go first is they is they is they're sort of thinking about, like you said, this place where they spend most of their time in their life. And, uh, and you're right, those, and, and the, the, the more we reinforce and strengthen those important kinds of values, those ideas, that's where you know, mm. organizations have, have such a higher potential to truly thrive and outperform their competition. Well, let's even, let's even like level up a little bit about the neuroscience of that, right? So from a neuroscience perspective, when you create that authentic connection, what I call micro moments, that's actually triggering a node in your brain to remember that emotion and connection to that moment. And what science tells you is when you have that moment, 
you actually are, are really inclined to go create one for the next person mm -hmm. because you've actually fired that chemical in your brain. And so those empathetic moments, those micro moments are actually building the wiring that allows an organization to have that network to, to thrive. Uh, because as a human being, we love that emotional and the emotion is what we remember. We don't know. We might use a logical thinking um, and I can't speak for you guys, but when I go logic versus emotion, I tend to remember the emotion because it, it innately drives some sort of response internally inside me that creates the memory. And so I think to your point, Pat, those are the, those are the memories and, and meaning and thoughts that are recalled when you ask someone to describe a great event of their, oh, we had this, this work experience and it was amazing, right? And you can see them line up. And then when you say, hey, tell me something that didn't work, and you can see them go, right? Like you can see the chemical shift in their body between mm -hmm. excitement, appreciation, abundance versus agitation and angst. Uh, and so if we can have more abundance, boy, it would minimize some of that dislike of, of yeah. the work, if you will. So, um, and you know, that helps, I think, amplifies the importance of, of storytelling too, right? Because that, I mean, people connect to a story that's more emotional based versus data and, and facts that don't really trigger, you know, some, some emotional response in, 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 your, in your brain. So that, that is why that is so effective in, in meetings, mm -hmm. um, pitches, pitches yeah. <laughs> and uh, speaking, whatever it might be. But, you know, to what you were just saying, a, a, a question I, I have, um, can a meeting be successful with a little bit of angst? And what I mean, or maybe angst is the wrong word, but, but as we know, and we've all been in them, meetings can sometimes you know, mm -hmm. we can disagree and we can have tough conversations and we should, and we need to um, respectfully, of course, always. Um, and sometimes we can leave a meeting feeling frustrated, but um, you know, how do we, how do we balance that to, mm -hmm. to say this memory, <laughs> that node in my head is going to remember this meeting actually in not the most positive emotional way, but it was productive and it was effective and it did start to drive change. So how, how do we, yeah. how do we think about no, that? I love that. Cause here's the thing. We are all nine year old kids at heart and every nine year old kid wants to be heard. That's it. So even if there's angst in a meeting, if you feel heard, that is critical to how you leave that meeting. And so often, you know, if there's angst and there's no, I felt, I felt stunted, unappreciated, then that's that negative, that negative, oh, poor Pat. Bye, Pat. Um, that's the negative. Um, he's, he's just trying to come back on so he's not between us. Yeah. I know what he's doing. He's, he's, he's logging on and off. Now he's going to come in on the right-hand side. He's yeah. just feeling way, way too overwhelmed. Too, you know, yeah, yeah. Oh, what can we say? Bald, bald is beautiful, you know? That's right. Oh, like, he did it. He look at this. over. He did. It was look at completely that. See, that was actually a completely played by your part. Yeah, I exactly. Know. I'm out and I'm back because I wanted to be on this set. That's all. Yeah. Much, I felt much, much more relaxed now. All right. <laughs> well, what were you bald guys talking about? <laughs> How we were missing you and it was creating an emotional moment for me. There you yeah. go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We actually stopped talking. We couldn't, we couldn't go any further. We were, yeah. I was getting, I was getting close to grabbing the, the Kleenex. Uh, I was getting teary eyed and emotional. It, it, it was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm super sarcastic. Um, so no, we were just just discussing <laughs> the notion about you know Dan's question was great. It was like some meetings have angst and there's disagreements, and that's totally healthy. You get to a better result usually. Um, I was lamenting the fact that we're all nine year old kids. So if in the end the 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 angst is over overarched by feeling feeling listened to and appreciated and respected then the angst isn't that big of a deal. It's just angst, but it's not angst with hatred or angst with anxiety. Um, you know, and we've been in meetings where I'm, I'm guessing where someone just shuts you down. As soon as you shut someone down, yeah. they no longer are valued. Um, and that's what matters most. So I, I think it's your, you know, Dan, you're right. It's going to happen. It's how you respond to it is, is, is what's most important. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a you know, as as leaders, and well, any anyone who's leading a meeting, I mean, there's there's an op, there's a way to sort of disagree and explain why. I mean, I, I you know, and say, look, I I hear you, but 
you know, here's what I'm, it, and I think that there's an art to that and that takes, which kind of leads me to this next question. So your, your model, which I love is this concept of nudge, measure, feedback, and grow. I think that that's, yep. that's, that's great. And, and I know uh, your technology and really loose terms here, you know, you, you get feedback before meeting starts to help prioritize what are the objectives, what are the focus points, and then you get authentic feedback, um, you know, right after, mm -hmm. uh, similar to, to, to 360 feedback, but really more it's around team feedback on each other. How did we do? Were we effective? Did we uh, achieve, achieve the objectives that we confirmed mm -hmm. in the beginning of the meeting? And then we share, um, and it's not a personal attack, or, but it's an opportunity. So next time we, we meet, we, meet mm -hmm. we can do what we did great again, or we can be and, and or we can be more effective on where we didn't do so well. So, um, you know, when we talk about the leader experience, which I know is a big part mm -hmm. of what you do. So help us walk through, you know, what are, how does that work? And what is the leader experience? Um, and how do we, you know, how do we achieve this, this type of just candid ongoing mm -hmm. feedback kind of pre meet pre meeting yeah. and, and post meeting? Yeah. So let me give you an example of how it works. And I think this will be helpful. And I think it helps kind of unpack really the impact of it. So, you know, we, we create our own 45 uh, area, what we call our lead framework. And so it's based on 45 areas. Those areas roll up into uh, 10 dimensions and those 10 dimensions roll up into three themes, right? So if you want to work on um, culture for all, that's a theme. If you want to work on relationships, that's a theme. And if you want to work on productivity and strategy, that's a theme. And then there's areas underneath that. So imagine, you know, Dan, one of your focuses is compassion, right? And so the way our solution works, and that comes out of um, the authentic theme, if you will, the area and dimension. And let's imagine that, you know, our solution, what it does is it looks at your calendar and it says, okay, at the, based on the subject line and, and some other stuff going on underneath the hood, it says, where are the meetings that Compassion may need to show up for Dan, right? And we're going to nudge Dan at that meeting to do Compassion for most likely a team meeting, a one-on-one -on -one meeting, one-on-two meeting, Right. And so we're going to look at that and say, this is the op opportune time to give Dan a nudge. So we send you a nudge literally three minutes before. Now, one of the brilliance of our solution is we've built it today inside Microsoft Teams. So we're, we're work is gets done. So we're not another app someplace else you got to go to and something else you got to look at. It's literally inside Teams is one of the chat functions, if you will, or a chat channel. So you get that nudge and at most you'll get a nudge morning and afternoon, but that's it. So it's just enough to be a touch point, but not too much to be super annoying. So you get the nudge. After the meeting, we say, hey, Dan, in this meeting on a scale of one to five, how compassionate do you think your behavior was? So the nudge might be something like, hey, in this meeting, use stories to connect to your team to share purpose, as an example, right? So you'll get asked, did you do that? But at the same time, those individuals that you've asked to help you grow are asked, hey, was Dan compassionate in this meeting? Did you notice that on a scale of one to five? So in real time, that data is aggregated and delivered back to you anonymously in the form of a leader team perception gap. So, you know, you know, Dan, you thought you knocked it out of the park and you said, yep, four out of five, I did it. Your team might go in aggregate, ooh, mm, uh, two out of five, 2.5 out of five. So in real time, you've noticed that there's a gap, a negative gap of 1.5, so we deliver you a little learning, how you can be more compassionate, thought jogger, as we say, but you have a choice. So you might realize, yeah, you know what? I wasn't, I get it, but you might be curious. So you can choose to ask for written feedback. So in that moment, you hit a button, shoot. Hey, Dan's looking to literally learn how to be more compassionate. Can you please provide him some written feedback? And it, it's structured like this. What were the situations you saw this in the meeting, compassion or didn't see it? What were the actions Dan did or didn't do? And what was the impact it had on you as an individual in this meeting? That again gets rolled up, and delivered back to you in real time anonymously in observation one, two, and three. And what's great about that is if you look at traditional learning models, and especially in organizations, it's out of context and it's reactive to the situation, right? You're in a classroom, you're online learning. Going back to that emotional connection we talked about earlier about the brain, by getting that feedback, we're moving that emotion to the moment, we're creating an experience. And that experience actually accelerates growth and learning up to, up to the 70% mark, just based on research and literature and whatnot around that. And so what's really powerful about that is the immediacy and the target in terms of what you're working on. 
it's not like a traditional um, end of year annual review where it's like, overall, you're doing okay and do these three things. That's great. But what do you do with it afterwards? It's not like a 360 review where it says, here's all the areas you need to grow. Now put it in the drawer and we'll check in next year with you. So there are a number of different use cases. You know, we have DEI, we have culture, um, we have uh, the extension of employee experience, leader experience. Uh, and so all of these, the big, big, big takeaway is it's, it's a single thread on a single behavior from nudge to measurement to feedback. Um, and that is the power of immediacy and the specificity that drives growth in, an, in a human being, if you will. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, it makes, makes total sense. Yes. And I love, you know, clap to that. Yeah, clap to that. <laughs> That's awesome. and as, uh, I've know, been pitching lately, if you haven't noticed. Yeah, so I've got I was just getting ready on. to say, you're man, on. you got that. That was just like, down. yeah, that was, that was, that was a fist bump moment. That was, that was <laughs> awesome. And, and, you know, Dan and I, we've been, you know, been product designers and builders in this, we'll call it the employee experience category for well over 20 years now. And what I love about what you're doing and how you're approaching it from a design perspective is you're getting, like you said, that sort of understanding that moment um, and the measurement and the, sort of the whole feedback loop, so to speak, is just so much more in context as it's happening. Mm -hmm. Because what we've learned over time is like, you know, we're doing like, like you said, whether it's uh, annual employee engagement surveys, even monthly, you know, pulse surveys, leadership development. When you ask someone to think about another person in aggregate about a behavior or an attribute and say, you know, in general, how would you explain this person when they're, you know, in meetings? It's it. Our brains are, are, are they're, they're, I don't know how well equipped they are. Well, they tend to just kind of aggregate down and we land in the middle somewhere. Eh, it's a three out of five. You know? Yeah. But, but how helpful is that really? Right. So uh, because the learning opportunity, the change opportunity needs to be in that, you know, close mm -hmm. to where you as a person still have that kind of behavioral memory. Like it's still there. Yeah. Like we talked about earlier, like things we, our brains really remember moments. Yeah. Um, and then when you get that, that feedback and that opportunity to change, like our brains are so much better wired to receive the information, mm -hmm. understand it, understand the context, probably are less defensive about it. Um, mm -hmm. And um, it's because we, we just become more open to it over time. And then, it allows us to kind of yeah. move along this yeah. change continuum. So it's just, it's such a better design approach towards, towards, mm. you know, the overall employee experience category. Yeah. And, and that's, I mean, th that's, that's the specific reason why and I'll, I'll leave names out of it, but some of the, the largest EX companies are talking to us about partnering mm -hmm. because they just all stop way up here mm -hmm. at that annual or monthly. And when you think about trying to change, you know, so again, my background is consumer psychology. So I come from this all from a consumer perspective. Right. Running experiments, nudging people through experiments at the grocery store, whatever it is. So I kind of come from it from the perspective of if you want change to happen, you need to nudge them immediately before that desired behavior that you want to have happen occurs. And traditionally where this falls short in any of the nudge science and specifically nudge science in organizations, it is, it's a bit abstract about when you're getting that nudge into what behavior and is there an opportunity in that moment? Um, and so to your point, Pat, by tethering it to a moment, it really increases the likelihood that that behavior is top of mind in that moment. And that is critical. I mean, I've been in meetings. We use it internally. I think that's good practice. If we're going to, we're going to sell it, we should probably use it. Um, and I'll, I'll be in a meeting and I'll be like, okay, I'm working on a nudge. And sometimes I'll peak or sometimes I'll remember, but I know I'm like, I'm focused on X. And I want to make sure I demonstrate this because it matters to my team that they see I'm putting effort in as well. Um, and my team has the ability to tell me that I didn't do it. Uh, and that's really important, you know, that, that there's that transparency. You know, one thing I didn't talk about, which I think you guys both would love, by the way, from a design perspective, is um, in the next week or two, we're actually building gratitude into this. And so imagine getting written feedback. You know, let's say I, I did a meeting, I let it. Uh, and you both give me feedback and you both give me really meaty, important content. I have the ability to say back to you and I don't know who you are. Hey, that was amazing. That helped me grow. That was impactful. Yeah. Because in that, again, uh, super over psycho psycho uh, psychologically driven our, our design is now that's firing a neuron in your brain to say, wow, I feel appreciated. Mm -hmm. And that appreciation makes me want to be more a part of this process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great. It's the yeah. other, it's the other dynamic, yeah. the other side of it. I, it's awesome. We call I, it, we call it actually, you yeah. know, I started calling it as a two-sided marketplace. Yeah. 
Mm. Uh, it really is. There's the leader side of development, but there's actually the participation side uh, of the process. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, that's that's how you build true connection and 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 collaboration, right? I mean, you just just understanding that your feedback ma matters, right, and, and is helpful, uh, whether it was. Um, you know, an opportunity or, or a strength or whatever it might, might mm -hmm. have been. And, you know, and I, I think one thing, and this is a great segue in, into the con this concept of, of, of change uh, is I completely ag agree. And I think we all know this getting feedback in the moment, typically mo and we, we, I think we, if we all put ourselves in the moment, it, re it, it makes sense to us. M meaning if someone tells us something, maybe we don't want to hear it, but we recognize it because it just just happened, right? You know, and and we it sort of sinks in a little bit more. And I and I think there there's some, um, you know, some authenticity and 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 just realness that happens when you get that feedback in that moment because typically most aware human beings um, can understand and and relate to that. But if you're sort of doing this with a 360 or end of the year performance reviews. You can get more defensive because you've sort of forgotten mm -hmm. about it, or and you've exactly. taken time to justify it, right? Exactly. Because we're point. very, very, very good at that. Human beings yeah. are very, very good at <laughs> over over time, sort of saying, "Well, you know, that was then. This is now. I, I don't do that anymore." But guess what? Ten minutes after something happens, you haven't changed that quickly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you know, and and so I and and this is that idea of change, right? You know, change happens slowly. Change happens mm. with every conversation, every little nudge, every every yeah. you know just small moment so well, anyway let me ask I, you guys I just, a question yeah. about change i think this is yeah. I, I love is loving that conversation why do you think i wrote this down why do you think change typically fails at the individual level and we can define change as a huge broad I, yeah. term so yeah well i think there's a there's a few dynamics to that you know one is desire to change but let's mm -hmm. just let's just let's begin with the idea that let's say i, I want to change i have yeah. an intention to go from you know i want to be a good human being and i i say hey you know what? i want to know what my strengths and weaknesses are and i want to continue yeah. um i think that we why do we you know i'm trying to think why why are we resistant to those sort of constructive feedback moments, you know, and then change. Well, I mean, it's, I, I'm guessing you're probably going to say there's something neuro something related <laughs> to this, right? Because it takes, it takes some time. It does take some absolute intention and time there we to, go. Uh, uh, to allow things to change. And I think that actually that may feel like uh, sometimes like, you know, I, I don't, that's, uh, I, I can't take the time to do that right now or, you know, because, yeah. and this is why these ideas that we're learning, you know, around like meditation or whatever, mm -hmm. learning how to kind of quiet the space in our head to absorb things and move into it. It's a lot of learning how to rewire your brain. And I think yeah. that s the social world that we live in kind of works mm -hmm. in typically in opposition to that. That's my best guess at it. Yeah. No, that was great. Yeah. Dan? Yeah, yeah. I see. I always let the the older brother go go first on on, the, on hard so he, hard so questions. I thought you were going to say the more I, handsome brother, but okay, that's well, fine. True. Oh, that, that's right. Yeah, the <laughs> brother that still has an, enough hair not not to shave the head. Um, no, you know, I I think um, so. I think cha change is ba you know when we go through any sort of movement or, or or change, the desire to change, someone has a desire to change because they they believe. With that change, something will will be will be better, right? Something for either people involved who um, who they're changing for, or for themselves, or for the moment, or for whatever it might be, right? There there is some um, they they see an opportunity, kind of to get to the next to the mm -hmm. next level, whatever that that might be. So I I, I think you know why people want to change is is very clear. I think why I think why they don't is it's very simple. I I think it's um, behavior modification takes people are stubborn and, yeah. and I think human yeah. beings um, you know typically will um, you know it, it, to, to take and listen to, to feedback um, I think requires uh, you know a, a kind of a, mm. a high level of being you know very humble and, and understanding and sort of you have to sort of sort of check yourself a little bit and, and um, I think be willing to absorb feedback and, and, and be reminded why change is, is, is necessary. So I think it fails when we don't sort of link it to the why we need to change or why we want to change. Um, I think that, you know, it's sort of what's the purpose of change. 
right? Because it's going to be hard or it's going to be a pain. It's going to be extra work, mm -hmm. but we have to re relate it back to the purpose. And if we don't relate it back to the purpose of why we want to change that, I think that's probably why it fails. So, yeah, I think and I agree with both of you. You know, there, 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 there's different, different reasons why you change. One is kind of predicated on my book, which is the crucible, the adversity moment. That is a forced mechanism, right? Like uh, when my dad passed away when I was 20, that was a forced mechanism to reflect, right? Like I could continue on like he did in his life and have some of the same results. Um, you know, my dad passed away at 49 or I could reflect and make a change in my lifestyle, make a change on choices that I made down the road. Those are the forced choices. But what we're talking about in the ecosystem of an organization, and some of those could be forced, you'll be fired if you don't do X, sure. But if we start from the position of intent, we intend to change. Um, and we can even take feedback out of this conversation. Often our intent is there, but it is, it is the, how do I phrase this? It's the inability consciously to put it top of mind, right? So I'll give you another good example. So I've, I have Blinkist. If you guys know what Blinkist is, but it's basically like cliff notes for adults on online at this point. That's why I can think about it. Um, and it's great. I wrote a book. I read a book today about being more pirate. It took me 15 minutes. It was fantastic, right? So I have great intent to do this every single day. I have now started to move it from every day to every third day to every fourth day. Why is that? Well, the reason is, is that it's not top of mind and isn't made a priority. And so I, we believe as an organization that change is hard because change needs to be present. And then thus the nudge process of what we're doing is making that desired change that you've indicated that you want to do. We want to help you. You know, as our tagline is, we want to be your digital coach, right? So we want to, we want to help you be where you want to be down the road by being with you today by reminding you what you said you want to work on. Um, and that reminder, again, immediately prior to that event, really increases that likelihood that you're going to do and practice whatever that is. Um, but it's hard, right? To your point, like yeah. intent falls short of action. So how do you put the action yeah. into it? Yeah, yeah, and I think, you know, a big part of what um what we believe in is, is in, you know, is inspired change, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so how can you, inspire change and I, I think it's it's you inspire change by by showing this if we change this is what we can expect right and i and i think that's sometimes where we where we where we fall short as as leaders and in organizations mm -hmm. we sort of outline the change that's necessary but not why we want to mm -hmm. change or why we need to change or why it's important to change and and so i i, I and, and then once we know here you know, then we can rally around that reason and that cause and that why, and then change becomes inspired. And now mm -hmm. people can, you can yeah. have those authentic connections come together and say, yes, I want that. I believe in that. I believe in what you're saying. I believe in this vision. I believe in that North star that you've outlined. Let's change together. And then it comes down to those small behavioral mm -hmm. changes that happen Funny daily, habit. which yeah. is exactly what you do. You know, it's, it's, it's those, how you act in being, it's those nudges. It, it, it's, it's quickly taking advantage of a moment and allowing someone to reflect, change, you know, will change, alter, change, and grow, right? And I, cause I know the last part of your model is, yeah. is grow. And that's ultimately what we want here yeah. is we have to see growth. We need to see growth for change to happen. Well, and I think, you know, um, just to kind of bring this back around why the meeting, right? Because that's how do you make meetings suck less? Uh, which is, I still love saying that out loud, even though investors kind of cringe when I, when I say it, um, <clears throat> it's less positive. They need a more positive, op, 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 you know, so now we went to like, we'll make you love meetings. And they're like, that's too much. What do you want? You know, anyhow, um, not to call back investor problems. Um, so, so when we talk about meetings, the reason why it's so important is that if those in your ecosystem witness the attempt, just witnessing it, that in itself breeds vulnerability, breeds trust, yeah. and breeds respect. And in doing that in that ecosystem, owning your mistakes, your, your, your follies, is so critical to bridging that authentic connection. And so yes, water coolers or conversations are great, but that's usually with people you already know and trust in the organization. That's not gonna be Sally in accounting who you don't necessarily see that often, but you're in enough meetings with Sally and you've invited her to help you grow, 
she has a different perspective than Tom, who you work next to in a cubicle. Um, and so, you know, I think that's how you make meetings better is that you allow people to show their vulnerability and human, human humanity um, around, yeah. you know, and I think this last year, by the way, has brought that out. I mean, how many videos is it of kids barging in in meetings? Well, traditionally, you know, two years before, a, a parent like, get out of here. Now they're like, hey, here's Sally. She's so cute, blah, 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 blah. Out she goes, right? Like, so it's really allowed us to be more human over the last year um, in this yeah. ecosystem of virtual environment. Uh, oh, Pat, I, I could tell you were gonna say something. Oh, yeah, well, I know we're both uh, jumping in on that. I you know, 100% agree. It's been so fascinating to watch just people talk about their work and life, you know, in, in, cause the word they're dwelling in the same space, you know? Um, yeah. And, and even like we were on a, Dan and I were on, we're on a client meeting um, earlier this week. And as people are thinking about, you know, times to have, we, we had a, there was a, one team in India and there was another team here. We're trying to kind of coordinate schedules. And the, the team that was here in the, in the Midwest was like, you know, we got to put kids on the bus at this time or whatever. So the time for us is this. And then the team that's in like, New Delhi is like, well, okay, it's, you know, it's well, one, it's a really hard time in India right now. Yeah. yeah. And, but, but yeah. two, like, you know, what's the best timing for them? It's like, okay, it's 8 p.m. But anyway, the, the point is like, and when you're, and even when we're hearing the team in India, you know, we're hearing the, when, when they're on, we're hearing the sounds of New Delhi out the window, you know, mm -hmm. and, and you're just so um, just aware of the broader context. And it does, I just keep thinking about that. Wow. Like, how amazing is this that I can actually feel a connection with? Someone who I would have just said, oh, he's just a data analyst or she's just a whatever. Yeah. I don't know why I say just, you know, just kind of put them in that box. <laughs> I mean, but then yeah. I, but it, there's just, anyway, there's so much richer understanding. And then it's, so it does feel to me working in that team environment, just, mm. just a lot more, um, just a lot more depth, a lot more fabric, you know? Yeah. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, you, you get to. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. so well, I'm, I'm, I'm such a time focus and I'm like, oh, we have three minutes left. Da, da, da. So like, I'm so like, so I, I, I <laughs> I'm the worst. Um, but like I, what, I, what, I, what I'm interested in is over this last year, I mean, you two guys come across as just genuinely authentic anyways, right? Do you find that because of that, you're bringing out more authenticity of those you're interacting with who maybe traditionally were a bit more buttoned up? I, I think so. I mean, I feel like it's both us. I feel like we can increasingly be ourselves, which is great. Mm -hmm. And then I'm, and I'm also seeing, you know, the world just much more relaxed in general, mm -hmm. but I don't know how much of that is, you know, the, our con the context that we're in, or if it's, you know, other people just kind mm -hmm. of listing up overall, Dan, yeah. what do you think? I, I mean, I think, um, so, I mean, a big part of our, our, I mean, I love the question. It, it, you know, we really believe in, in that, in that whole person experience. And what do we mean by that? It means sort of bringing your authentic true self into anything and everything you do. And, and so, and, and that is, um, what I think not only is that a part of our business, it's we try to live and breathe that every day. And so we, and that's why we do this weekly call and we have this incredible community of people and we try to show up as ourselves and we joke around and we, we talk about our personal lives. And, you know, I think we're trying to normalize conversation that typically wasn't as comfortable to have mm -hmm. in, in the workplace. And, and I think, and I hope, and we're just a small piece of that equation, but um, I, I'm seeing so many more organizations and some of the best leaders, especially in HR and those that manage, you know, employee experience strategy and companies really starting to think like, like this. And, you know, how can we, how can we bring people together and let them, you know, truly be themselves and support the community, right. And, and, and get more involved and, and it's bigger than just the company, bigger than just being profitable. Mm -hmm. It's bigger than just, um, you know, the work day, it's actually making the world a better place. So um, I'm seeing it happen and I'm so happy to say this, I'm seeing, I'm starting to see this trend. There's a lot of work to do, but, um, yeah. um, you know, we're proud to be a small part of it and, and proud to be getting to know people like you, yeah. James, that are doing the same thing and that believe in real change and authentic relationships and connections. So, you know, really honored to have you on the show today. Thank you. Um, and I, I'm super fun to be here and I, I, I just kind of want to leave on this note, like, you know, they said on the, on, on the onset of this, if you work on average 90,000 hours of your life in an office, why not be a better version of yourself? Why not be a more authentic version of yourself? Because it's really hard effing work to be something else. It's just really hard to do that. Um, and so I encourage anyone to listen. It's like if you're struggling with it, you know, just people embrace authenticity. It's such a 
battered word right now, but man, it's just so much easier. Like it's just so much easier, you know? So anyhow, yeah. that's my soapbox. <laughs> well, we support you on well, that it's one. A, yeah. Absolutely. And, and thank you. You know, I was going to, um, my final question was going to be what you just answered was what can we start to do to make meetings better, work better. And, and I think you just said it, be, yeah. be authentic, be yourself. Yeah. Don't be afraid yeah. of that. And, and, and one other thing, I mean, and, own, and own your mess. I always believe in owning your mess. If you don't own your mess, yeah. you can't clean it up. So <laughs> just both sides of that. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah. Well, uh, that's great, great, great messages. And, and again, thank you, James. And uh, just super excited to see Q Change uh, growing and everything that, that you're doing. And, uh, you know, thank you. Um, it's happy to have you a part of the, this community. And thank you to our awesome community. It's one o'clock right on the nose. So um, central time. Thank you, James. And if um, you can find James Kelly on LinkedIn and um, I, anyone who's here probably saw the LinkedIn. Um, so I suspect James, you're okay if people connect yeah, with yeah. you and send you messages. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Have yeah. a great rest of the day. Thank you and guys. Thank you, Pat. And I'll see you. I'll see Thanks, you as James. soon as we hang up. Yeah, I know. <laughs> see you guys. By the way, you have to clean see up your everyone. mess at your desk. Okay. See ya. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yes. I, I'll own it. I had to get you that. <laughs> See you guys. You, bet, you better. <laughs> Bye, guys. Thank you. Right. See ya. Bye-bye.